Hello once again. I've got another vintage typewriter to show today. This is a Smith Corona Electra CT electric typewriter made in the 1970s. I don't know when exactly this was made because this, like many Smith Corona typewriters, do not have a date code on them, but I do know this was made sometime in the 1970s. This is another electric typewriter, like the one I, like the brother one I showed recently. This is not electronic. There's no electronics in this. It's all electromechanical. There is a continuously running electric motor, which drives a bunch of linkages and cams and all other mechanical goodness to do all the typewritery things that this thing does. There are a few things uh, about this typewriter that are the same as the brother I recently showed, but there is a lot that is different. Like the brother, this typewriter is similar in a lot of ways to a standard manual typewriter. You've got your type basket here with all the type bars that swing up and hit the paper. It takes a ribbon you can see here. You've got your platen and your bale and your margin setters and everything else. Your keyboard. There's your on off switch. Unlike the brother, um, the space in this is electrically, it's, a, it's electromechanically actuated. So the motor, it, it needs to be turned on for space to work, but power space works. And there you can hear the nice bell. Yeah, power space is spring driven, so the motor doesn't need to be running to do power space, but the motor does need to be running for normal space, which is funny. You've got your tab key right here. Like the brother, this has uh, permanently set tabs at every 10 characters. And it's spring driven, motor doesn't need to be running. It's got a power return. And what's sort of interesting about this typewriter, and not like a lot of other electric typewriters, is this has a correction feature. That's what the CT means. As it says here, correction typewriter. This has a correction feature. Now, it's not like the correction feature in electronic typewriters that use a, a, a film ribbon and then a, a film correction ribbon that lifts the print off of the paper for correction. This uses just a normal fabric ribbon to print onto the page. So in order to do the, uh, the correction part, this typewriter and others like it used a special ribbon that was, it was a fabric ribbon. It was black on the top half, but it had basically white out on the bottom half. The bottom half of the ribbon was this white out material. And what you were supposed to do if you made a mistake and you needed to make a correction on this particular unit, you take this particular lever. Well, first you backspace to the mistake you made. Then you yank on this lever and the lever spring loaded. So you have to hold it. And while you're holding this lever, press the letter uh, that was made by mistake. And holding this lever and pressing the key makes the ribbon move up so that the white part is exposed to the page and it'll punch the incorrect letter through the white out part and stamp over top of the error printed on the page. Kind of neat early way of doing a sort of automated or at least semi-automated correction on a typewriter. But there's one giant caveat. Uh, those ribbons with the with the white on the bottom half, first of all, they're expensive to buy replacements today. You can still get them, but you'll pay like 18, 20 bucks for a single ribbon. Whereas a black and red ribbon you can get for six bucks on eBay. But the big problem is that it makes a mess inside the typewriter. The white part likes to like flake off and it, it's really gunky and sticky. This thing had a ton of white gooey gunk all over the mechanism from its original correcting ribbon. I just have an ordinary black ribbon in this now. But yeah, and and I've I've only been able to clean like 20% of it because a lot of it's really in there and and I've never been inside this thing. I've never had to go inside this thing. It works perfect, which is nice. So I've never had to go inside it. Um, but yeah, those white, those 
a half white correction ribbons make an awful mess. I don't recommend them. If you have a typewriter like this that can use one of those ribbons, don't bother. Just, just put an ordinary black ribbon in it or a black and red. You could, even though it's cumbersome compared to a typewriter that has a proper red print setting, you can use a black and red ribbon in this and just do the correction feature to print red. You'll get like one, like <laughs> three words a minute doing that, but but uh, that's, that's something you could do. So this isn't just useless, but yeah, I, I would recommend either doing that or just use a plain black ribbon like I've done here. The correction uh, feature and the special correction ribbon is expensive and messy. And you know, people with a vintage typewriter writer like this don't really want to get a bunch of sticky gunk inside the mechanism. That's a pain in the butt. So that's just my recommendation. I didn't get this with the original correction ribbon. Um, this actually had no ribbon in it. And I put that plain black ribbon in it. That's a that's an old ribbon. That, that's, this is the ribbon that originally came on the brother. It still prints nice, so I stuck it on this. Your on-off switch is right here. When you turn it on, you can hear the motor and there's a little neon lamp, neon power indicator in there, which is nice. Motor's nice and quiet in this, way quieter than the brother. You just hear a bit of a buzzing because it's sitting on the uh, coffee table and reverberating off it. But yeah, very nice. Right here is your typing force selector. So when it's set to L, the keys require only a pretty light touch, similar to a computer keyboard to actuate. If you put it to H, it's a little bit heavier and more typewriter-like. So that's what that switch does. And other than that, it's it's a pretty uh, pretty ordinary typewriter. If we take a look at the keyboard here, it's a pretty standard layout, except for one major difference. There is a major difference between this keyboard and keyboards we usually see. Do you notice what it is? It's over here. Take a look. There's no one key. There is no one key. And this isn't a trick or, or something that's hidden. It's exactly as it seems. This typewriter simply has no one key. A lot of typewriters, especially early ones, had no one key. Um, it was, they did this, they, they omitted the one key just to save like the minimal cost of putting an extra key there because you can print a one just using a lowercase l. And that's what, uh, that's what they meant for you to do. If you needed to type a number one, you just hit a letter L. And it makes a perfectly acceptable number one. But what if you wanted to make an exclamation point, which is usually the shifted one? Well, to make an exclamation point, you type an apostrophe, backspace, and then do a period. And it makes a rather crappy exclamation point but an exclamation point nonetheless very very funny i did not uh notice this when i bought this typewriter i bought this at a goodwill for ten dollars um had i seen that i probably wouldn't have gotten this thing because that's just way too weird for me although i've softened to it now now i think it's pretty hilarious but yeah no one key in its place this is the margin release so we've got some unique things that you don't see on a computer keyboard, like half and a quarter, although the Brother typewriter has that. Um, shifted comma is just comma. Shifted period is just period. No plus key. We have two shift keys with a shift lock. Shift lock locks the keys down. Um, so when you don't have to hold shift to type capitals. But unlike the caps lock on a computer, shift lock shifts everything. So the num if you type a number with shift lock on, you'll get the symbols instead. The only reason this is like, this looks like it's sticking is because it's currently not running. If I turn it on, it pops back up and it works normally. See that? Now, unlike a lot of typewriters that shift the carriage up and down when you hit shift. This actually tilts the carriage. See that? And that tilting is what allows the upper part of each type bar to strike the page instead of the lower part. 
We can remove this cover to change the ribbon. We uh, flip it, flip the front part upwards like that, and then it just comes off. Now here's something that really sucks about, in particular, these later Smith Corona electric typewriters, and I think some of their later manual typewriters too, that other manufacturers didn't do. Smith Corona, for some dumb reason, decided to use not the two inch ribbon spools that were standard for like a hundred years on typewriters. No, they decided to use ever so slightly smaller one and a half inch uh, ribbon spools, which is stupid. I This is a standard two inch ribbon spool. I had to just hack away at it until it was small enough to fit on the uh, on the spindles. Really, really dumb. This red switch here, you can use to ch manually change the ribbon direction, but it will auto-reverse the ribbon when it gets to the end. I don't know what these things are for. These little things sticking up out of the uh, tight basket. No clue what they're for. To get the cover back on, just gotta line the hinges up with the little pegs they rest on, and then snap it down. Looking at the carriage here, you can see correction typewriter. You set your margins with these sliding tabs for a standard letter size sheet of paper. I usually set them at 10 and 75. So when the carriage gets to about 70, the bell sounds to let you know you're nearing the end of the line. Nice sounding bell. You've got your paper bale, which also has the character scale printed on it. These little rollers are adjustable. You've got your line spacing setting here. Standard would normally be one. You also have one and a half and two lines. If you set it to zero, the carriage, I think on this, the, let me turn it on and see. I think, it, I think the carriage will still advance when you do a return. Yeah, it will. I think it's doing a two-line advance, but the carriage is also unlocked. See, it doesn't ratchet. Whereas in the other settings, it ratchets. You've seen me use the carriage release here, so you can move it around. There's your uh, paper release. It also lifts the bale up a little bit. You've got your paper rest right here. Looks like it's flapping its <laughs> wings. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, but yeah, there it is right there. When you're at the margin, you can hit margin release and then keep going past the margin. Like that. Same thing for the left side. There you go. And then Kind of a neat feature that Smith Corona themselves came up with, I think in the 1950s, and they really advertised it quite a lot when they first came up with it. It's called Page Gauge, and it is a way to tell, um, without having to make guesswork looking at your page, how close to the bottom of the page you are. And here's how it works. It took me quite a while to figure out how it works. So what you do is, so a letter size sheet of paper is 11 inches long. So before you insert your paper, insert or uh, turn the platen until the 11 mark is, you know, close to the edge of the paper bale, just in a place where you can easily see it. And then stick in your sheet of paper. I've just got a random sheet of paper here. And two-handed job, insert your paper. And then you're gonna look, you see on the left it says end, and that corresponds to these red markings. There you can see a number two there. As you turn the platen, and of course these numbers will go around once or twice before you actually get close to the end of the paper. I think I've got one more to go around here. 
So now we're on the actual count because we're getting close to the bottom of the page. And you can see there where it says two, that means we are two inches from the bottom of the page. Turn it a little more, now we're one and a half inches. And we're now one inch from the bottom of the page. So this tells you, okay, you should, you know, get ready to end this paper and uh, put in a new sheet of paper. And then we get to the end there. Yeah, kind of neat little feature there. A uh, Smith Corona exclusive. Kind of cool. So that's how you use page gauge. And I think that's all the functions of this thing. Um, we'll see on the bottom there. There's the label. Um, back at this time, Smith, in the 60s and 70s, Smith Corona um, was using uh, a logo that said SCM because Smith Corona, I think in the 60s, I'm not sure, they merged with another company. I completely forget the name of the company, but it starts with an M. So the uh, technical name of the company was Smith Corona and then whatever the uh, name of the company was. I forget what it was now. But they still use just the Smith Corona brand um, on the typewriters. And then you can see there, SCM Corporation. And this was only for, you know, for a while. Um, beginning in the late 70s or early 80s, they just went, they, they renamed the company itself to just Smith Corona Corporation. Well, I think this was made in Singapore. I think it says on the back. There you can see nice big SCM logo on the back there. Made for SCM Corporation by its subsidiary, Smith Corona Private Limited, Singapore. So this was made in Singapore. Uh, that's pretty much all the feature of this thing. Let's actually demonstrate it. So I'm going to set the camera up, put in a piece of paper, and just bang away at this for a minute or two.
So here's what the type looks like. This thing is great to type on. It's very fast acting, so you can type on it almost as fast as you can on a computer. It's it's very nice for fast typing. It's it's way nicer than the brother in that regard. Um, and the print looks good. I see some uh, ink uh, bleeding, like uh, for the letter E's, how the middle of the E gets inked in. I'm not sure if that's something that could be adjusted, or if it's just the ribbon, or or what. But on the whole, very nice looking print. I should demonstrate. Let me uh, put the sheet back in here. There are a few repeating keys. Um, you might have seen me use the dash, the dash repeats. The period repeats, and the letter X repeats. And you just do that by holding the key down harder. Very nice. Um, using the correction feature, if we had the correction ribbon, if I make a mistake, I type the word the, and I put two E's. Um, what you would do is you backspace to the error, you hold down the correction lever, and then with your other hand, press the letter E again. And that, uh, you can see it activates the ribbon vibrator to bring up the uh, top half of the ribbon. And it would punch uh, the white out in the shape of an E over the mistaken E. And it doesn't advance the carriage, you can see. Well, that is all there is to show of the Smith Corona Electra CT electric typewriter from the 1970s. I think this is a very nice typewriter. Um, it it types really well. It's It's got nice print. And uh, that correction feature, even though I wouldn't recommend people use it for its uh, original purpose today, it is a novel feature on this. But uh, yeah, it's not the most... Uh, featured typewriter I've seen. There's no settable tabs, there's no red ribbon options, stuff like that. But it does type really well and it overall works really well. I also kind of like the design of this. It's quite compact, especially compared to the Brother. Also, it's friggin' blue, powder blue, and you, you gotta love that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not the most well-featured thing, but it seems to work really, really well, and it's very nice to type on. Very, very nice. These particular Smith Coronas are not very collectible. They are all plastic bodied, um, so they're not worth a lot um, in the grand scheme of typewriters. I got this one for $10. They work really well, they're just not that collectible because of the uh, plastic construction. But uh, if you come across one, and you don't mind the fact that it lacks a one key or a, or a red ribbon uh, mode or stuff like that, this is a very nice typewriter um, for actually writing on. Um, Smith Corona made a few other typewriters based on, uh, or what I believe was based on this same chassis. One was called the Electra XT. Um, it was one of Smith Corona's last electric typewriters uh, in the 80s. Um, it was basically a slightly uglier version of this. Smith Corona also sold a model called the Super Sterling, but instead of the correction feature, it had a proper black-red ribbon setting. And it's funny because the Super Sterling name was originally used on a typewriter in the 50s or 60s, and then Smith Corona reused the name uh, for a model from the 70s, which is kind of odd. But yeah, that's about it. Um, I did get the case with it. The uh, handle is broken, old plastic, but uh, the case itself is fine. You can see it says Smith Corona, and it also has the uh, SCM logo inside it. Let's see if I can show that. There it is. So yeah, got the case with it. There's the price sticker. Paid ten dollars for it. So yeah, it's a nice typewriter, but I don't think I'm going to keep it. The lack of a black and red ribbon setting and the missing one key makes this not a keeper for me, even though it's a very nice typewriter for writing on. 
I'm still looking for my perfect electric typewriter. Something with black and red ribbon feature, and even though I wouldn't use it that much, I would like to have a settable tabulation setting. Uh, a typewriter that meets that requirement would be the, uh, the uh, older Smith Corona Electra series, the Electra 110, 120, 210, and 220. I'd love to get a 210 or 220. Um, that to me would be my ideal electric typewriter. So I might see if I can get some money for this one on my local buy and sell page. Nobody ever sells typewriters on there. Um, they're just never found or in the thrift stores around here or anything. So this, this one might garner some interest. There it is anyhow. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time. <laughs>